Hello, everyone. Today, we explore how COVID-19 has affected disabled people across the globe. Vera Kubens from the University of Birmingham in the UK will let us know more about the impact of COVID-19 on disabled people in low and middle income countries. What kind of exclusion were disabled people subjected to? And in what sectors? And what can we learn for the future? Again, our speaker is Vera Kubens. I'm Rodrigo Silva from Cogita to Press. And this is Let's Talk About Social Inclusion. Hi, Vera. Welcome to our episode. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. So an obvious question, perhaps. Why is this topic important? Uh, so this topic is important because um, the majority of disabled people live in the global south, but um, usually um, academia um, focuses on is disabled people in the global north and is very much led by scholars in the global north. So our research focuses particularly on the impact of COVID-19 on the global south, and we highlight that disabled people have been actively and systematically deprioritized during the first um, wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And disabled people in poverty, uh, disabled people in the global south are disproportionately affected by poverty, and that is well documented. And we also show that that has been compounded by the impact of, of the pandemic. And also, what was very important for us is to show that um, while that sort of disadvantage is often used to justify that disabled people are inherently vulnerable, and reinforcing medical ideas about disabled people as weaker. Or inherently vulnerable, we want to show that um, the, that vulnerability is actually socially created and is the result of being actively and systematically um, deprioritized by decisions that were made during the pandemic. And um, we've also found that there was very little evidence that anything has really changed after previous disasters or pandemics. So for us, it is about documenting the impact that the pandemic has had so that there is that evidence and there is that accountability. Of course. Before we jump to uh, to explore more about the findings of your study, uh, and you touched upon that a bit, what were you hoping to find? So what was the research gap? So as I said, there isn't really a lot of evidence that anything has changed from previous emergencies. So, and it's, so really looking at disability from a social point of view is a gap in itself. So really we wanted to take that approach to show how disabled people have or have not been included during um pandemic management decisions and our research is based on a literature review so it was secondary evidence we were looking at and we wanted to identify how disabled people have been affected in health economy education community and highlight how they've been marginalized not just in one sector but across really the whole of society and that focus kind of beyond just an individual sector was really important to us um, to show uh, that um, it, it it, the issues cannot be addressed in isolations and collect evidence that can inform both future research um, into dis disabled people's experience as well as campaigning on policy. And we, we very much looked, not just summarised the evidence, but looked at kind of what kind of evidence there was and what there wasn't as well. So particularly one of our findings is that most of the research came from um, mostly NGOs and so disabled people's voices weren't represented and there also wasn't a lot of kind of peer-reviewed academic research so that in itself is kind of a key a key finding so we highlight critically what was and wasn't documented and who is telling disabled people's stories absolutely you have uh, started a bit what would you highlight about the findings we found uh, four themes that really went across all of the sectors um, across health education uh, employment and community and these were um, that uh, firstly, disabled people have been actively deprioritized in emergency planning for the pandemic. And despite the fact that um, there are many countries that have now signed up to the UN Conventions for the Rights of Persons with Disability, um, as soon as the pandemic hit, that sort of went out of the window and disabled people were at worst excluded. And at best, they were an afterthought, kind of sh try to sh um, shoehorn in after the policies had already been made or policies just weren't implemented. And then I think the second finding I've already touched upon is really the medicalization of disability, that it's still very much seen as a medical problem or a deficit problem, that there's something wrong with the person. Um, so that there, there, there were many countries had protocols around who 
it was eligible for emergency care and that involved making judgments around disabled people's quality of life, that they have that, that their lives are less worth living. And like I mentioned, labeling disabled people vulnerable without questioning why they are vulnerable and who makes them vulnerable. Then the third theme is really that dis all the issues that disabled people have faced during the pandemic were interconnected. So you can't just look at health or education or ec the economy in isolation, or you, can, you can't resolve them in isolation. And that's something that we kind of really highlight in terms of development initiatives, which look at very much quick fixes with limited funding, and that's not how you resolve issues. But really, for example, the issue of food poverty highlighted that um, it's not, it's an economic issue, but it was also an issue in terms of access to places where food was distributed. And it's also an issue that again, impacted health because people were having nutritional deficiencies. And so it's really kind of an issue that spans across the sectors. And it's really important to kind of consider the interconnection between it, it, these issues to achieve sustainable change. And then for us, the final, really most probably most important theme that came out was the involvement of disabled people in decision making um, in, ev in everything that affects them and how important that is. So as I said, there was a lot of evidence that didn't come from disabled people, but from other people talking about about disabled people and the global disability rights motto is nothing about us without us. So it's about talking to disabled people to understand their concerns, involve them in the planning process so they are not um, excluded. And we've also particularly found that in many cases where governments were failing to provide food, for example, it was disabled people's organizations who stepped up and kind of organized things locally to, to get food to their members. So really the role of disabled people's organizations is extremely crucial. And can these uh, findings impact somehow in terms of public or social policies? Or has something been already impacted? So um, I think there's a strong message from us for policymakers to engage with disabled people and consider them in all policy making and then follow that through to implementation. So not just make the policy, but make sure that they are implemented. Um, so there's more engagement needed with disabled people and their organizations. Um, for NGOs, but also for researchers to work together to co-produce research and work actively with disabled people and work with them to amplify their voices rather than speak for them. And we, uh, our, our work has now concluded, but we're still working with the UN Partnership for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, who initially um, kind of asked us to produce this work. Um, and to inform their programming in terms of disability and development. So based on our findings, we developed a framework um, to carry out situational analysis in countries to assess the situation for disabled people in countries and ensure that the work that UMP RPD commission is targeted effectively uh, rather than focusing on quick fixes. Of course, we have touched upon um, some of the findings that your article revealed, uh, the so what of your research. Let's now focus on the now what, okay? which you also did a bit uh, in the previous questions. How can we further close this gap in the literature that you mentioned? Because your article uh, touched upon several areas, uh, as you said, mental health, uh, economics, also not only disabled people. So how to address this topic more in the future? So I think, uh, as I said, our research was focusing particularly on secondary data, but there's a lot more evidence needed in terms of original evidence that is generated and particularly beyond the first wave of the academic. So we focus uh, of the first wave of the pandemic, first wave of the pandemic. So really it, there needs to be more research around kind of um, how things were managed further on, particularly around equitable access to vaccination, which is something that was sort of beyond the scope of really what we were looking at in terms of the time frame of our research. So there's a, we identified a number of gaps around, around that and particularly education as well. There's very little um, around access to education for disabled children and not just during lockdowns, but also the impact on returning to school and attainment gap, gaps. And generally there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of numerical evidence emerging, um, particularly around impact uh, on death rates of disabled people compared to the general population, the impact on poverty, which is very difficult to quantify, and then the impact particularly on people um, who live in institutions, 
Um, and even where that data has been gathered, there isn't really any baseline data to compare it to. So I think there's a wider effort required to, to kind of collect that data routinely. So there is a baseline to measure any new data against. And that's something that we're, that's a really key com recommendation for my research. And again, how, there's definitely more work to be done about developing ways in which disabled people's voices um, and can be better included um, in research and particularly disabled voices from the global south and disabled researchers and can how disabled people can be involved more involved in research to co-produce knowledge. Vera, you have studied these topics uh, before, so can you provide some additional resources and materials for our listeners uh, about the topic discussed today? So we have a full literature review report available on our project website, which is um, disabilityundersiege.org um, under current projects. And we've also hosted a number of webinars where we've um, spoken to disabled people from the Global South about their experiences. They're available on our um, project YouTube channel. Um, as well as a workshop that we ran with a, a number of other um, kind of case studies into COVID-19 on how to use creative methods and how to build research partnerships with the Global South. Um, we've also published some articles in the conversation blog about the impact and about of COVID-19 on people in the Global South and about learning points for disability inclusive recovery. And um, I think one of the main really useful resources for our, for our literature review was the International Disability Alliance's Voice of People with Disabilities campaign, which shares dozens of stories uh, from disabled people of what it was actually like for them in different countries during the pandemic. And it's a really, really powerful um, kind of statement of firsthand experiences and the challenges people faced, as well as sort of the resilience and the, the, the incredible activism that um, people displayed. Vera, to close our episode, if there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk, a punchline of today's discussion, what would it be? I think it's about talking to disabled people, working with us and collaborating with disabled people, listen to disabled people about the experiences rather than talking about us and make sure that we are involved and everything that affects us. Straight to the point. Vera, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. This podcast is powered by Cogitati Press. You can listen to this episode on the Let's Talk About Social Inclusion website, on Cogitati Press YouTube channel, and whatever you get your podcasts.